Welcome to this tutorial on continuous and differentiable functions. In this tutorial, we're going to begin by talking about the basics of continuous functions, then move on to differentiable functions, and we'll also have a look at some theorems for continuous and differentiable functions, including the intermediate value theorem and the mean value theorem. And we'll also have plenty of examples and diagrams throughout the tutorial. So what is a continuous function? Well, the diagram shows an example of a continuous function, and the informal definition of a continuous function is actually very simple. We say that a function is continuous if it's possible to draw the graph of the function without taking your pen off the paper. So just to make this clear, this is not really a proper definition. You certainly wouldn't write down this definition in an exam if you had to define a continuous function. This is just something to have in the back of your mind, as a kind of intuitive concept of a continuous function. So to be more precise, we say that a real valued function defined on the set of real numbers R is continuous at a particular point if the limit of the function as x approaches that point is equal to the value that the function actually takes at that point. So in this definition we're using x0 just to represent a fixed value of x. So when we talk about x approaching x0, we're talking about x approaching a certain fixed point. And we will look at plenty of examples of continuous functions, so hopefully this definition will become more clear as we go on. So in this definition we are using the concept of a limit, and we did talk about limits of functions in a previous tutorial. So therefore we can write this definition in another way using the formal definition of a limit, and we can actually write this definition using epsilon and delta language. So these two definitions here are exactly the same, it's just that in the second definition, instead of writing the word lim, we're actually using the proper definition of limit, whereas in the first definition, we're just writing the word lim, and assuming that we know what is meant by a limit. And in this tutorial, we generally won't be using this epsilon and delta definition for continuity, because this just comes from the formal definition of a limit, which we have covered in a previous tutorial. So we'll just be sticking to the first definition, and assuming that hopefully we understand what is meant by the limit of a function, at least in an intuitive sense. So let's just have a quick look at some examples of continuous functions. Which functions are continuous? Well, first of all, any polynomial function is continuous. So if you have something like x cubed plus 4x squared plus 5, in other words, just a sum of powers of x with some coefficients in front of them, it can be proved that the function is continuous, so it's useful to bear that in mind. So what this means in this particular example is that if you wanted to say what the limit of x cubed plus 4x squared plus 5 is, as x approaches a certain point x0, it's just going to be equal to x0 cubed plus 4x0 squared plus 5. So here we're just applying the definition of continuity and saying that the limit of the function as x approaches x0 is equal to f of x0. Also, many other common mathematical functions are continuous, including the trigonometric function sine x and cos of x, the exponential function x of x, and the natural logarithm log of x. And you can see in the diagram that the graphs of these functions don't have any gaps or jumps in them, so you can draw them without taking your pen off the paper. And just a note, we have cheated slightly by including the log function here, because log of x isn't actually defined for all real values of x. It's only defined when x is a positive number. But you can say that log of x is continuous at every point where it's defined. In other words, it's continuous at every point in the open interval from 0 to infinity. So when we say that a function is continuous, we mean that it's continuous at every point in its maximal domain. In other words, the set of all points where the function is defined. So that's why we can say that log of x is continuous. Here are some useful rules. These rules are sometimes referred to as algebra of continuous functions. So imagine you have two functions f of x and g of x, which are both continuous at some fixed point x0. Then it can actually be proved that f of x plus g of x is continuous at x0, so if you add the two functions together, you get another function which is continuous at x0, f of x minus g of x is continuous at x0, f of x times g of x is continuous at x0, and you can guess the last one, 
f of x over g of x is continuous at x zero, provided that g of x zero is not equal to zero, so that we don't have a division by zero. So using these rules, we can say that since sine of x and cos of x are both continuous at every point x zero, that means sine of x plus cos of x, sine of x minus cos of x, and sine of x times cos of x are also continuous at every point x zero. And sine of x over cos of x is continuous at all points x zero where cos of x zero is non-zero. And sine of x over cos of x is of course also referred to as tan of x. So using algebra of continuous functions, we can show that the tan of x function is continuous at all points where the cosine function is non-zero. Another useful rule is the continuity of a composition of functions. So this rule says that if f of x is continuous at a certain point x0, and g of x is continuous at the point f of x0, then that means the composite function g of f of x is continuous at x0. So in other words, a composition of continuous functions is continuous itself. So to illustrate that with a diagram, the diagram shows the graph of x times sine 10x, and sine 10x is a composition of the functions f of x equals 10x and g of x equals sine of x. So if you let f of x equals 10x and g of x equals sine of x, you can see that sine 10x is the same as g of f of x. And we know sine of x is continuous, and 10x is also continuous because it's just a polynomial, so sine 10x must also be continuous. And then, using algebra of continuous functions, we can say that x times sine 10x must be continuous because x is a polynomial and therefore continuous, and we've shown that sine 10x is continuous, so therefore x times sine 10x is just a product of continuous functions. So we've seen some examples of continuous functions, and you might be wondering which functions are not continuous. So what would be an example of a discontinuous function? Well, remember, we can always define a function in a piecewise manner. So in this example, we have a function which is defined in one way when x is smaller than 1, and another way when x is greater than or equal to 1. And obviously, you can't draw this function without taking your pen off the paper, because there's a jump at x0 equals 1. So in other words, the function is not continuous at x0 equals 1. But remember, just because a function is defined in a piecewise way doesn't necessarily mean that it's not continuous, because if we change this function very slightly, so that now f of x is equal to 1 instead of 2 when x is greater than or equal to 1, then that changes the graph of the function, so this part of the graph moves downwards, and now there isn't a jump at the point 1 anymore, and in this case the function is continuous at all points, including x0 equals 1. So now we're going back to an example which is similar to one we've looked at in the past. So we have a function f of x which is equal to 2 to the power x when x is not equal to 2, and when x equals 2, the function takes a value of c. So here c is a real number which we haven't specified, and the idea is that we can create different functions by changing the value of c. And the question we want to answer is, for which value or values of c is f of x continuous at the point x0 equals 2? So we can easily see from the graph that the function is continuous at any other point on the x-axis. We just want to work out how to make it continuous at the point x0 equals 2. So for example, if we set c equals 5, then we have a little hollow circle here to show that the function doesn't pass through this point, and a filled-in circle up here to show that the function passes through this point instead. If we set c equals 2, then the filled-in circle is down here, or with c equals 8, it's up here, and so on. And meanwhile, we know that as x approaches 2 on the horizontal axis, the function approaches a limit of 2 to the power 2, which is 4. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is equal to 4, and this limit is completely independent of the value of the function at x0 equals 2. Because remember, when we think about x approaching 2, we're thinking about x being not equal to 2. So the value that the function takes at x equals 2 actually makes no difference to this limit here. So in this example, if you imagine that the only thing we can control is the value of c, 
That means we have absolutely no control over this limit here, because the limit has no dependence on the value of c. The only thing we can control is the value of the function when x equals 2. So the point is that in order to make f of x continuous at x0 equals 2, the only way to do that is by choosing c equals 4, because that's the only way we can ensure that this equality holds, so the limit of the function as x approaches 2 is equal to f of 2, which satisfies the definition of continuity. And of course you can easily see from the graph that with c equals 4, that's the only way we can make the function a continuous curve with no gaps in it. And in the second part of this tutorial, we'll move on to differentiable functions and look at some further examples.